Okay, we're now live. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so good morning and welcome to this meeting of the licensing committee. My name is Councillor Anna Bradnam and I'm the chair of the licensing committee. Um, we have a few points of housekeeping to start with, please. Uh, so please make sure that your device is fully charged and or charging. Please switch off your microphone unless I invite you to speak. When you finish speaking, please turn off your microphone immediately and please speak slowly and clearly, remembering that not everybody's link is as good as some people's. And uh, don't talk over or interrupt anyone. If you wish to speak on an item, please indicate that using the chat function uh, which uh, myself and the vice chair will be monitoring. So present online with me here are the following members of the licensing committee who I will invite to introduce themselves. Members, uh, after I call your name, please turn your camera and microphone on. Allow just a second or two and then introduce yourself so that we can note your presence. And then please remember to turn your microphone off after your introduction. So, Councillor Dr. Shrabona Bhattacharya. You're muted, apparently. Oh, you. <coughs> Volume is very low. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Councillor Shrabona Bhattacharya. I am. I am representing Cambon Ward. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have Councillor Gavin Clayton present? Don't think so. OK. Uh, uh, Councillor Graham Cohn has given his apologies uh, and he's being substituted by Councillor Heather Williams. So out of order, Councillor Williams, would you like to introduce yourself now? Hopefully I won't be out of order through the meeting, Chairman, but <laughs> Heather Williams and I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you. I meant out of sequence. Thank you. Out of alphabetical order, should I say. Thank you. Councillor Claire Delderfield. I don't see her here. Councillor Williams, could you perhaps contact Councillor Delderfield just to check if she's intending to attend? Um, Councillor Wilson, you I mean? I think you mean Wilson, not Williams. Sorry, I apologise. Yes, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, Councillor Wilson. I do apologise. Thank you. OK, Councillor Peter Fane. Peter Fane, Shelford Ward, present. Thank you. Councillor Joe Hales. Joe Hales, Melbourne Ward. Uh, Chair, before we go on, could I? Is it OK if I pop over to Councillor Mallion's house? Because I think the, the setup over there is far more inconducive to work than my, my setup. I want to go and play in the wigwam. Um, Councillor Hales, that's charming. <laughs> Maybe later after the committee meeting. Uh, Councillor Jeff Harvey. Councillor Wilson, perhaps you could ask Councillor Harvey if he intended to arrive. Um, Councillor Mark Howell. Present Chairman, representing the Papworth Ward. Thank you. Councillor Steve Hunt. Hello, Steve Hunt here, representing Histon in Fington and Orchard Park. Councillor Alex Mallion. Hello, Councillor uh, Alex Mallion, representing Long Stanton Ward. Thank you. Um, and we've been advised that Councillor Peter MacDonald um, is unable to arrive right now but he hopes to join us a little later. Um, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning Chairman and everybody. Uh, Deborah Roberts, um, Foxton Ward. Thank you. 
thank you very much. And I am Councillor Anna Bradnam and I'm the member, one of the members for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. OK. So um, <laughs> I think you've forgotten me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, you're at the top of the page. Sorry. <laughs> Councillor Wilson, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I, I'm Councillor Eileen Wilson, elected member for Cottenham and Rampton Ward. Thank you very much. And my vice chair. So thank you very much indeed. Um, so uh, we were advised that the lead cabinet member for environmental services and licensing would have liked to attend, but is unable to do so because of a clashing meeting this morning. But he has said he will observe what we have our, our deliberations by means of the recording later. So if any member needs to leave during the meeting, please could they make this known so this can be recorded? And perhaps, uh, Councillor Wilson, would you be so kind as to, if you see a new member arriving, could we just note that in the chat so that we know when people have arrived? Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce the officers who are supporting us. Uh, so firstly, uh, Ms Jane Jackson, who is the uh, author of the report in licensing. Ms Jackson, would you like to introduce yourself? You're muted. Sorry, <laughs> I'm Jane Jackson and I'm a te technical officer in the licensing team. OK, thank you very much, Jane. Uh, uh, Mr. Paul Weller, who is our legal advisor. Good morning, everybody. My name is Paul Weller. I'm the legal advisor for the committee this morning. Thank you very much. And uh, do we have John Hall with us? Who is? Would you like to introduce yourself, John? Good morning, everyone. Uh, John Hall, so um, Commercial Licensing Service Manager. Thank you very much, John. Right, OK, so the first item is apologies for absence. Um, we have so far one apology for absence, that is Councillor Graham Cohn and Councillor Heather Williams, as we said earlier, is substituting for him. Um, can I ask Democratic Services if there have been any other apologies of abs or absence for the meeting? Thank you, Chair. I've received no further apologies, but um, I will note the absence of councillors Clayton, Delderfield and Harvey if they don't join us later. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, do any do we come on to item two, which is declarations of interest. Uh, do any committee members have any interests that they would like to declare in relation to items on the agenda? Shaking of heads, nothing in chat. OK, so that looks like there are none. If, however, as we go through, somebody realises there is a declaration that they ought to make, please could they make that known to me? OK, so item three, the minutes of the previous meeting, which start on page one of our agenda pack. I'll go through page by page. Um, so. This is the meeting that was held on the 10th of February 2020, a year ago, thereabouts. Um, so are there any matters of accuracy that any members wish to uh, raise on page one? Page two. Page three. Page four or page five. OK, so are we so that's none are there, uh, So are we happy to re, uh, confirm that this is an accurate record of the meeting? Agreed. Thank yeah. you very much. Super, thank you. So in due course they can be signed. So moving on to the meat of the meeting, agenda item four, the statutory taxi and private hire vehicle standards. Um, could I ask Miss Jackson to present the report, please? Um, can I just suggest, Miss Jackson, I think perhaps 
you found this in the past, it might be better not to put your camera on. Not that we don't want to see you. It would be lovely to see you, but I think your internet connection is not strong enough to cope with both video and audio. So would you be prepared to present your report just on microphone, please? OK, um, yes, Thank you. so the Department for Transport has um, published its statutory taxi and private hire vehicle standards and it has made recommendations to local authorities to um, ad adopt this unless there are any compelling reasons not to do this. Um, our recommendations from the licensing department are in the report as, as you have in front of you and there are a number of things that we have proposed to do. Um, a lot of what's already in the report, um, in the standards, sorry, we, we have um, already got in our policy. And any questions anybody has about it, then feel free to ask. Thank you. Okay. So, and just to, to clarify then, um, the reason this is just full clarity on the agenda, on the report, it's not a key decision because this is purely a recommendation uh, that the lead member, lead cabinet member for environmental services and licensing should approve the new standards. So it's not a key decision for us. Um, and a reminder that the expectation is that these recommendations will be implemented unless there is a compelling local reason not to. Um, we have the um, the standards in Appendix A. Uh, as we, and I should point out that um, for clarification, the emboldening in uh, the standards was as received. This hasn't been done by our staff. It's as received. Um, and the our staff have gone through, looked at the aspects that are already really we're already doing and um, have come up with the items at Appendix B, which um, they identify as we, we might need to discuss. Um, I have, however, gone through a number of aspects of that emboldening. So if anybody has any questions on any of those aspects, we can ask them as we go through. So I think what I'm going to do, if that's OK, is uh, I am satisfied with all of the aspects, as it were, that we are not specifically considering. Um, but if anybody wants to ask, I'll just go through section by section. So does anybody have any sections in section? Sorry, any questions about aspects in section two, which is page 16 to 17? No. Nope. Nobody has any questions there. Um, of course, the, one of the aspects was that we publicise our deliberations and of course that will be by the means of this, the minutes of this meeting, but also by the policies that we put on our website. OK, section three covers administering the licensing yeah. regime. Um, does anybody wish to raise anything in section three? These run from page 18, 19 through 20 and 21. So has anybody got any questions about the aspects in bold or anywhere else? Um, Councillor Roberts has asked to speak. Yes, Councillor Roberts. Many thanks, Chairman. Um, I'm, I should have marked it. I'm not as good as you. you. You're wonderful at marking and you know exactly where you are. But it, I don't know whether it's a question that comes in here, but one of the things that I read that had come from um, the department was um, seemingly that um, such as ourselves would do need to do more training. I mean, I think we do very good training already. Can we leave and that until Deborah, sorry, Councillor Roberts, training absolutely, but it comes under a later section. That's fine, Chairman. Thank I'll, you. I'll pick it up with you when we come to it. Thank you Councillor so much. Vegetaria. I'm just asking page number 18, 3.4. Page number 18, 3.4. Yeah. There is a, I mean, there is a good practice example from other other council. Uh, my, uh, I'm just asking, is it a, is it a necessary to give this example of the council outside our 
our geogra our geographical domain i mean was it was it necessary to keep such example because there may be many such good examples or is it necessary or yes or no sorry are you saying um think licensing are you, uh, sorry are you saying was it appropriate to put that in at 3.4 as an example yeah, yeah, as an example um, it's not for us to judge that this is standards that have been set up by the department for transport they chose to put it in um, we understand what happened in Rotherham and I think perhaps uh, they recognise the history of past failings there and elsewhere is well known, but it's the transparency and resolution that Rotherham Council has demonstrated and the high standards that they now require that are rebuilding public confidence. So that's good news that the steps that they're taking are improving public confidence in the taxi hire service. Okay. Is that OK, Councillor Bhattacharya? Yeah. yeah. Councillor Roberts, did you put your hand up again? No, OK, right. Yeah. Um, um, Councillor Bradman, um, can yeah. I just say I've um, I've tried to contact councillors um, Delta Field and Harvey. Did you want me to try Councillor Clayton? Uh, um, I think, thank you very much, Councillor Wilson. I think if he isn't here, um, he may join us later. I should leave that for the moment, but thank you for trying. I, I've left messages for the other two councillors. OK, thank you very much. OK, so um, just a quick skirmish through those. Um, we do, uh, I, I'm just, I'm 3.5, we do arrange uh, to review our licensing policy every five years. We've always, always done so up to now. And we have a new uh, principal licensing officer uh, coming on board shortly and I'm sure there will be some um, minor reviews on an annual basis that she'll wish to pick up. Um, on 3.8 whistleblowing procedure, we have a general whistleblowing procedure for the whole council uh, which would incorporate this requirement. Um, 3.13 3.13 looks at do we engage with licensing authorities in neighbouring areas and we certainly do engage with both City, Hertfordshire and East Cambridgeshire uh, when we do consultations. Could I ask um, somebody to turn their microphone off? I think that might be Councillor Harvey trying to join us. <laughs> If perhaps Councillor Harvey could turn his microphone off. Great, lovely. Nice to have you with us, Councillor Harvey. We're on page 19 looking at the standards. OK, yeah. Thank um, you very much. Apologies for my lateness. I, I um, walked to the doctors and then um, took a different route back and got stuck in a flood. Oh <laughs> dear. My way through, um... Well, we're very glad to have you here. Thank you very much. OK, so then we move on to section four, gathering and sharing information. Um, Councillor Harvey, just to explain, I'm going through section by section and asking if anybody wishes to pick anything up and then myself and picking up items I've asked officers about. So section four, gathering and sharing information, goes from page 22 through to... Um, to page 28. So, and here we do come across one that we've got on our um, Appendix B pages. Um, at, just to, before we go past that point, 411 asks that we should maintain close links with the police, which I've confirmed with our officers this morning we do. So, then we come to 4.12, which is referred to in the report in Sorry, the chairman can i can i stop you at that i did yep, type sure. in me please yes do. Uh, thank thank you chairman um yeah i'm i'm a little a little perplexed actually about the um about the whole report and i'm not complaining about our offices i'm talking about the department of transport because it seems to me that we haven't got much joined up thinking here um the problems that have been encountered over the last few years were clearly known to both the police and to social services often. 
Um, and I don't think there's been any resolve um, and clarification of what went wrong. I think there's been an awful lot of sweeping under the carpet. But um, for, for this to work up from our side, actually can only be, I mean, it's can't be for the horse. Um, unless the police are doing their job and social services are doing their job, actually, it's very difficult for us to do our job. So I'd like a little bit more clarification about this working with the police. It actually is going to be. Will it be that if the police start to get reports in of um, bad, bad behaviour and activity, that they will let us know immediately? Because if they don't, why the heck should we be signing our names on that we've done training to get it right? So, so OK, I mean, Councillor Roberts, thank you for that question. Can I ask Miss Jackson? whether we receive information proactively from the police as well? Yeah, um, so if there are any reports, we do we do get we do work quite closely with the police. And if there's anything that they think is relevant to the license or that we should know, they do inform us. OK, and um, Mr. Weller, do you have any comment on that? Clearly, there, there is there is a liaison between your officers and the police where where it happens. Uh, additionally, there have been occasions where the police have put forward what's uh, the common law note uh, disclosure notification, where they've made us aware of uh, perhaps an arrest or something that they've carried out. So they they are uh, they know that that we have an interest in the taxi. Uh, and private hire trade, so they know that if they do have it cause to interview uh, an office, uh, a, a, a driver in one way or another, then if they need to and they feel that their criteria are met, they do notify us. Thank you, Mr. Weller. OK, is that satisfactory, Councillor Roberts? That they do re they do give us information as well as us giving them information. I think I, I, it's no, I think it's less than satisfactory, and I can I feel sorry for the officers because um, they're going to have an onerous task here trying to make sure that people are safe. But actually, um, if you don't know that an investigation is going on, you can't start considering what you may need need to do it for yourself. It seems to always be after the act rather than during investigation so well but with but with all due respect councillor roberts we wouldn't necessarily know would we if we're informed mm. at the time that the police are undertaking an investigation about somebody that they think might be a risk to traveling passengers then that is that is reasonable is it not mm. And and obviously I'm not, they, I'm not sure that they I'm not sure that they they will do. Um, okay, I'm but afraid that there's too there's there's far too much um, secrecy actually when it should be much more open if you're talking about the safety of the public. You know, if they are so, getting so, reports so, okay. Councillor Roberts, what they have also of course do is they refer to the um, disclosure and barring service. So we would hear about some of those individuals through our. Uh, examination of the disclosure and barring service record for any applicant or at any renewal. So, you know, we, comment, and, um, and if there was a, a reactive concern, they would let us know. If they thought yeah. there was an immediate concern, they would let us know. OK, are we happy to move on then? Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you. So then we move on to 4.12 which is at the bottom of page 23 and it, re it refers to the fact that license holders should be required to notify the issuing authority within 48 hours of an arrest and release, charge or conviction of any sexual offence, any offence involving dishonesty or violence and any motoring offence. Now what we understand now from our appendix at B on page 51. It says two aspects to this. There's the timing, how quickly they should report. Um, we currently report within 72 hours. And also we currently require people only to report 
um, when, there's, when there's been a conviction, but the request is uh, that we should report when there's been an arrest and release as well. So um, we need to look at the pages, uh, the, the arguments as it were on page 51. So we don't, oh, we've got a whole collection of people wishing to speak. So, um, Councillor Roberts, is is that something you wish to speak on or, was, or is your request to speak about the previous item? OK, so Councillor Hunt on 4.12, do go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I puzzled by the fact that in the proposal we appear to require notification of any kind of arrest, even if it was uh, uh, mistaken or uh, that seems strange. Um, I would have thought that, excuse me, my phone's playing up with, with pinging with notifications. Um, but, but 48 hours, can we realistically process that? I mean, if, if, what does it mean to notify? Does that mean that the person has left a telephone message or submitted something on a website? Or does it mean we've actually logged it and responded to it and acknowledged it? Because are we are we able to do that over um you know uh, over holiday periods and so forth and the um, other uh, question i had sorry the, the other point i had was um our current situation includes it explicitly mentions that it includes things like restraining orders and the proposal doesn't i would have thought we'd be quite interested to know about people who've been subject to a restraining order thank you um on the first element um I understand people can report either by telephone if it's during the week or they can report online, which would be picked up uh, after that. Um, so. Did have Councillor Fain. Can we have a response, though, from Miss Jackson about how we respond? Uh, how we receive those reports? OK, so it's, it's requiring the license holder to notify the, 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 the licensing or authority within 48 hours. Um, so we do have a report it page um, on our website where people can go and report. Um, we um, have supplied our taxi um, email address where people do report um, even over the weekends. It's not requiring us to 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 action what it's it's requiring the license holder to report. Um, so obviously to, to be able to action within 48 hours is, is quite difficult, but for them to be able to report it is is fairly easy. Um, and going back to what you said about the 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 other restraining um, order restraining orders. Yes, I, I agree that that should be within the proposal as well. It should be 48 hours of all. So we're adding we would we would wish to add in to the proposal. All of the elements that we have in our current situation. Because the proposal seems to be rather lighter, as it were. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is open for discussion, but um, the, the view would be that they would they would do it all within 48 hours. It's much easier than yes. For, for a, for a license holder or a driver to have to go and look through the policy and to see whether his um, conviction or his warning had to report it in 48 or 72 hours. Oh no, we're not suggesting a division. All I'm suggesting is that all of the elements in our current situation in the blue box on page 51 should be transposed to 48 hours. Yes, 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 that's what I'm saying. OK, so yeah. so is that OK, Councillor Hunt? Uh, sorry, I was stuck on mute. Yes, but I think that would uh, be a, a good amendment to try and make. Yes. OK, so good. OK, it's because it, the proposal simply refers to arrest and release, charge or conviction of any sexual offence, any offences involving dishonesty or violence and any motoring offence. So we would prefer for our policy that all of the items that we currently have as being reported in 72 hours should be reported in 48. Are we, does that make sense, members? Uh, and the point being, um, one of the questions was about arrest and release uh, because um, the person might have been arrested in error, but that doesn't mean to say it's uh, doesn't mean to say they shouldn't report it. It just indicates uh, that they were released again. Um, so, um, 
have Councillor Fain and then Councillor Ailes. Thank you. Councillor Fain. Thank you, Chair. Yes, as you pointed out, we currently only expect people to report if they are convicted of an offence. Uh, this will be a new type of report, and I hope that our guidance to in the way that we respond will take account of the fact that this is not a conviction. Um, clearly, people are innocent until proven guilty, um, so the, the report has to be dealt with in a different way. There's also the question of a motoring offence. Uh, it wasn't quite clear to me whether they're supposed to report any motoring offence. There are many different levels of motoring offence and whether it is only if they've been arrested for a motoring offence, which would be very unusual um, because that is not necessarily the case for motoring offences. Uh, I just wonder if we clarify what sort of motoring offence they will need to report within that time scale. Well, it refers to such as speeding, doesn't it, uh, in our current situation. Um, Ms Jackson, is there anything you wish to contribute there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's clear that, that they have to report that it's a speeding offence because obviously that builds up um, and has uh, an, uh, an effect on their licence if they have too many points. Um, the point that you were saying beforehand about the, um, sorry, Councillor Fain, um, about the. Um, Perhaps, Chair, would it help if I clarified what I was saying? Apologise. Let me just. Um, sorry back again. Um, sorry, I th my understanding is that there's been there's been a suggestion which I would quite um, subscribe to that all of the wording that we currently have in our current situation box. Um, the, 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 the items that people must report within 72 hours, we should transpose that all into the 48 hour reporting regime. Um, sorry, does Councillor Fain, does that? Um, but with the the comment you, you were making, Councillor Fain, was that um, given that that's everything, it should be dealt with proportionately in terms of our response. That and also in relation to a speeding offence, it would be unusual for somebody to be arrested for that, and therefore it might be felt that they did not need to report it until such time no. as there were points on their license. Uh, and from from my point of view, I do, I do not read it like that. I don't interpret it like that. I think it's whether they've been arrested and released um, or any of these other things. They're separate issues, separate reasons. Is that how other people understand it? Um, okay, Councillor Bradman, um, Miss Jackson would like to speak. Thank you, Miss Jackson. Sorry, don't. Back to what was said about the rest, uh, rest and release and people being um, innocent until proved guilty. It wouldn't be a case of if somebody was um, reporting that they've been arrested and released that they would be um, under an enforcement action. It would be more of a protection to that person in case um, in case there was a report of a problem um, further down the line. So it would be a, a note on their file rather than um, requiring any enforcement. So. Again, it's 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 a self protection for the driver. OK, thank you. So um, we yeah. we don't have any other requests to say. Oh, yes, Councillor Hales, you have a question. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, it's. Uh, I must appreciate and I, I support these, the obviously the, the recommendations. Uh, we don't have too much uh, say over it because these are the ones coming from above us, shall we say. Um, that's fine. I just wanted to, if I may, um, ask the, through you, the legal officer to make sure that we can implement um, additional stuff or are we, are, we, are we expected to be using the government guidelines or are they just, they want them added into our policy? And then as, as we are now discussing all of our, our existing policy plus is what I'm after. Thanks. Mr. Weller, could we 
Could you clarify that, please? For the purposes this morning, it's adding these extra bits into our policy. Should hypothetically a driver come before you or at a later stage, a driver come before the magistrate's court by way of an appeal of your decision, then the court or yourselves will be brought, have brought to your attention both your own policies, but also the statutory guidance so that you are aware as it were, of all the supporting documentation there is. Does that answer your question, Councillor Hales? Yes, thank you. Lovely. OK, thank you very much. OK, so are we broadly in favour of the principle, but we'd like uh, the words that we currently have in our current situation to go into the 48 hour request. Would that be possible, um, Ms Jackson? Yes, to include the arrest and release as well. OK, super. Thank you very much. OK, so that takes us, if we go back to, uh, that was on page 23, um, and we've talked about feeding back to the police and getting response to the police. So, 4.17. 4.20 looks at um, disclosing if they've previously held um, a license with another authority. We already check for that. Uh, 4.21 refers to use of the database NR3, which we already use. Uh, 4.29 refers to having a robust system for recording complaints, which we do. Um, But, however, we don't currently have a brilliant way of analysing trends. But can I ask Miss Jackson, I understand we have a new system coming in which might make that more possible. Can you just explain to us what we currently do now and what we're pr proposing to do in the future? OK, so the, the, the system that we have at, the, at present, um, M3, where we record all our jobs, does allow a certain amount of um, coding for the, the, the most common um, um, complaints such as door signage and behaviour complaints and um, driving without due care and attention, for example. I think we can we can separate it into five different options and um, we are having a new system coming in which is called Tascomi and um, we will be able to um, pull out more reports um, there are different phases of this going forward. Um, I'm not 100% sure when or what reports we will be able to pull out, but I think the phase one, um, we are looking at being able to pull out reports for um, various things. And it should be, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm 100% sure, but it should be from then that we should be able to do it. It's something that we'll need to speak to um, the person who's leading the, the project at the moment and maybe speak to Tascomi as well, but it's something I can look into. So thank you, Ms Jackson. So to be clear, we already have a robust system for recording complaints, which is NR3, but this new system will enable us to do more of the analysis. So that's great. Thank you very I, much. Sorry, and that should sorry. be coming in in March, I understand. It's M3, not NR3. Oh, sorry, M3. Yeah. I do apologise. Thank you. Right, OK, so moving on, 4.31 um, asks that we have a way uh, of guiding passengers how to make complaints, and we have that both on our website and by means of the internal vehicle notice. And then moving on, um, if we come to, I think that's all of section four uh, dealt with. So then we move on to five, which is decision making. And um, at 5.3, this is the point that uh, I had raised um, and indeed others have raised. It requires that all members are trained and ad are, undertake ad adequate training. And it says as a minimum, training for a member of a licensing committee should include licensing proce procedures, natural justice, understanding the risks of child uh, sexual abuse and exploitation, 
disability and equality awareness and the making of difficult and potentially controversial decisions. And before this meeting, I did ask what our training criteria are, and I was advised by Democratic Services that we do annual training. Uh, we did training last year in summer 2020, and our, I believe our legal advisor has said that it's, it's recommended that we have training every two years, so um, which I believe we comply with. And we do that jointly with the city. Um, and I know that Councillor Roberts wished to ask a question on that. So Councillor Roberts. Thank you very much, Chairman. Yes, I, I, I knew I'd read it somewhere. Um, and I suppose my question is, um, I don't really understand why we need to sign because clearly um, those of us that attend, and we have to attend to be on the committee, um, those of us that attend, our our attendance is, is recorded, it's there already. And I'm just a little bit concerned that um, there is going to be a bit of an onerous responsibility if we all individually sign that we've received training because um, if something goes wrong in the general picture um, is it going to be a question of um, that we can then be picked out as the people responsible um, because certainly in those um, now infamous cases there's been a clear written down of the fact that um, June note wasn't taken about what was going on. Presumably the councillors had been had training, um, but um, things were not acted upon. Um, it, I mean, it's it was an appalling situation of abuse, um, not just, just in Rotherham, all, all over the place. Are you saying that people who had signed that they had had training still didn't see, uh, didn't take action when you when yeah. it was? That, that's, like that. that's been that's been well recorded, Chairman. That um, the people knew about it, um, they were not acting, and the reason that they were act not acting is because they were feeling that if they did well, so. I think, excuse me, can I just say we don't we cannot um, uh, attribute motivation to people we don't know and haven't spoken to. So can I just clarify? Uh, I suspect this requirement at 5.3 mm -hmm. um, is hailing to an older time when we would have done training face to face and all mm -hmm. of us sign um, a, 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 an attendance sheet when we attend training anyway. And that's the sort of signature I imagine it would mean. Mm -hmm. Equally, yeah. our training is recorded on the website under yeah. our names. So I think it's simply confirming that we have done training. That does not in itself uh, exonerate us from acting on what we know and understand and have learned. And I think that is a separate issue. Any individual can choose or not to apply the training that they have been given. But the first step is that they should be trained and made aware of these things. And we cannot um, set policy for people who 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 have training and then don't act on it. Okay, Mr. Weller, could you just- Can I just, can I just add, add, add a little extra question on there? Yes. Um, I, I quite clearly understand what you just explained to us, Chairman, and I've got no problem with it. Uh, what I'm saying though is, do the officers feel with their information that they may have received that actually the training is going to be a lot different and it's going to bring into it elements that it isn't brought in at the moment, because I believe that everybody should be treated equally. And I'm sure I remembered somewhere in here the, the talk of the part of this new idea of training would be about equality. Um, and I'm not really sure that why that would be. We should be just treating everybody the same. That's what equality training does. Mr. Weller, could you um, advise this? Um, as far as I'm aware, the, the, the training that's been received to date has been from a nationally acknowledged trainer. Uh, I'm clearly I'm not responsible for the training that is provided for members, but I see no reason why 
um, the quality of the training will not be downgraded as time goes by and nationally, quality, nationally acknowledged trainers one way or another will bring into their new training if they change it at all these standard these uh, department for transport standards as well so that will be brought into the the, the overall picture um, i'm comfortable with the level of training that members have received to date mm -hmm. uh, i don't envisage that will change uh, i say i'm comfortable i tend to attend the training as well because as someone who is likely to be advising the subcommittees i want to know what you know before the meeting starts so me being part of the training is all is there other than that i'm not sure how i can assist further at the present yeah, that's fine the, uh, that's helpful mr weller thank you and just can i clarify um signing that you've undertaken training doesn't make you personally liable for um anything does it it's just simply saying i've undertaken some training no i mean again part of the training and uh, members who have attended the subcommittee will be aware that an important part of the decision is the reasoning and, and that's well where the, the the training will come out okay and it will, if there's a matter going to appeal then it would be the reasoning that is the subject matter of the appeal rather than the, the the training or the implementation of the training thank you very much mr weller and can i welcome councillor peter macdonald uh, to the meeting can i just check with you mr weller given that mr mac uh, councillor macdonald has owned, uh, just joined us will he be um entitled to vote on this uh, vote on the recommendation at the end of the dis discussion i think on that our colleague in uh, democratic services probably have a stronger answer than I do. Thank you. So, Miss Wallace. Um, Chair, given you haven't completed your discussions on all the standards, I would say so. Yes. Thank you very much, Miss Wallace. Good. So you can you can make your views heard, Councillor Macdonald. Councillor Bhattacharya, I can see your hand is up. You're muted. Okay, okay. Thank you, Chair. I would like to explain some some experiences of mine and my fellow uh, councillors, but I'm not very comfortable if it is if it is a live uh, live stream is going to the public. Uh, in which case, uh, you must make those discussions separately and outside this meeting, and and not hold it up. Uh, I mean, so yeah. They actually they actually involve the decision making, the <clears throat> safety and security of the councillors, because sometimes we do handle a greater level of criminality at the same time at the same time. So but um, I, I would like to discuss this into the panel, but I am not comfortable if this live streaming is go is going to the public. It would certainly is. Uh, and so, as I said, if you want to discuss that, Councillor Dr. Bhattacharya, that's fine and we can do that we can arrange a separate discussion uh where, where that's arranged but um uh, and it's for others than me to determine whether that should be in private but certainly we can discuss that with officers and and arrange a meeting to discuss that it, but it, this is being live streamed so if you don't want to discuss that on a live stream then we can arrange that separately okay please yeah thank, thank you, you. I'll just make a note of that. Councillor Roberts would like to speak again. Thank you. Just one moment, please, while I make a note. Councillor. Uh, okay, thank you. Councillor Roberts. No, no thank you, Chair. Still on item 5.3. My concerns have been answered, Chair. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Roberts. Okay, so moving on. Okay, Councillor Hunt would like to speak. Sorry, as well. yes, Councillor Hunt. Hunt. Uh, did, no, I didn't. I didn't have to speak. OK, right. Not, not okay. Thank you, Councillor Hunt. Sorry, right. That's all right. Don't worry. So moving on then, uh, carrying on through this decision making, my next note was at 5.11 on page 31, where it says uh, we should have arrangements for dealing with serious matters. 
Um, we do, uh, and uh, decisions on serious matters are dealt with uh, in consultation between the lead member for uh, environment environmental services and licensing in consultation with me as chair of licensing and um, in, in consultation with our legal advisors. Um, 5.15 at the bottom of the page, in the middle of that paragraph, it says licensing authorities should have a clear policy for co this consideration of criminal records which of course we do, and it's, a, it's an appendix to our current policy. So moving on to 6.6, 6, section six, which is about, dri remember there are drivers, vehicles and operators. So this is about drivers at the moment. So this is driver licensing. Um, and we come to 6.2, which is on page, um, Oh, sorry, I do apologise. Have I missed something out? Can we come back to? Um, sorry, yes, of course. Can we come to? I, I have skipped it. I apologise. Page 52, looking at 4.14. It's referrals to this disclosure and barring service. I apologise for going backwards. So this refers to the fact that the disclosure and barring service, in, in some circumstances, it may be appropriate under the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act uh, for licensing authorities to make referrals to the disclosure and barring service. A decision to refuse or revoke a license as the individual is thought to present a risk of harm to a child or vulnerable adult should be referred to the disclosure and barring service. The power for the licensing authority to make a referral in this context arises from the undertaking of a safeguarding role and further guidance has been provided by the DBS. Sorry, Chair, um, which could you repeat the page number? It's page 52, Councillor MacDonald, sorry, of the Appendix B. Yeah. And it's um, page 24 in the actual standards. So. The question in my mind was, if we revoke a license on grounds of risk of harm, do we refer to the disclosure and barring service? And the answer would be. Um, ultimately, yes, but very often these sorts of disclosures come up on a case that's already being investigated by the police. And indeed, the police would usually make that referral to the disclosure and barring service. If, however, something happened that didn't go to the police, then we would make a referral to the Disclosure and Barring Service if we felt that was appropriate. I wondered if Miss Jackson would like to speak first and then perhaps Mr Weller. Yeah, so it's, it's not routinely undertaken. Um, we haven't come across many cases where we would have to do that, but um, Relevant matters, yeah, they, going forward, it, it, it would be something that we would refer to the DBS. Um, Thank you. And and Mr. Weller, did you want to make any comment there? The only comment I would make is that, I, I apologise, I can't remember where it is, but there is reference within one of the replies from the consultees about a, a national uh, register or similar. I think the, the more that licensing authorities engage with national bodies or national recording systems, uh, the better for the trade as a whole. Mm. So if we do, it looks like we're not doing it currently, if policies or if procedures change in house so that that starts to happen, I see no bad thing coming out of that. OK, thank you. And indeed, the consultees um, whose responses are on page 53 of our agenda have all agreed that this makes sense. So I think we're, we're OK with that. Is that all right, everybody? All members happy? OK, good. So let's skip back then to element six, which is where we're talking about driver licensing. And um, 
the fact that at 6.2 it's requested that all licensed drivers should be required to evidence continuous registration with the DBS update service to enable the licensing authority to routinely check for new information every six months. And as I understand it, we require registration with that system anyway um, for, for drivers. Um, and the proposal is that we the uh, all new drivers applying should should register with that list. Um, and our proposal is that they should. I think uh, Miss Jackson, can you just clarify? Are we saying they should renew every six months or? No, so when they join the update um, subscription, the update service and they, they pay their subscription yearly, um, which it, can be a problem for some drivers because the, the DBS don't allow for direct debit payments. So if people's card details changes, it does create um, problems, but that's out of our hands. What, what the, we're proposing is instead of us checking every year to see that they're still subscribed, that um, we check every six months. To see that yes, OK, sorry, that's right. It's 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 the last section in the DFT that drivers who do not subscribe to the update service should still be subject to a check every six months and you're saying yes we agree uh, it should be every six months. Um, we have some comment from the the operators here uh, saying batch checking should make this easy and but broadly speaking people agree and that they one business observed that whilst there was a small cost to be incurred uh, could, that would be that would represent considerable benefits. OK, so are we all happy? Councillor with... Harvey has his hand up. OK, Councillor Harvey. Yes, I, I would just. Um, Councillor uh, Harvey, just before you start, could I just ask that you use the chat rather than your hand up function? Thank yes, you. I can yeah, see I, both, but it's all right. Just to clarify, we're using thank chat. Thank, thank you. you. Um, yes, yeah, just to um, be uh, reassured that um, the, the sort of criteria that we use, um, which I think I think boils down to, um, you know, this test of would I would I be happy for, uh, you know, my my daughter or somebody close to me to to um, use this um, taxi or, or, or private license? Is is that sort of aligned with the criteria that you would use to report somebody um, to? To the DBS system. I'm just sort of wondering whether there's because because the consequences of somebody um, being referred to the DBS system might be quite a lot more severe than merely having your uh, taxi license revoked because um, it because it could prevent all sorts of other um, career uh, paths. Could it not? So I'm, I'm just wondering is are we, are we sort of happy that those two things are aligned? Um. My understanding is that that's reasonable. Uh, I mean, anybody who has any contact with children or vulnerable adults has a DBS, gets a DBS check. It's not a, it's simply a, a recognition that these things need to be um, recorded and checked. Um, so I think it's a good thing that if they have not subscribed to the update service, Nevertheless, they should still be checked every six months, uh, and I think that's an improvement on our current annual check. And I don't think there's any implication. It's simply a recognition that these are vulnerable people. And, um, you know, I have a DBS check for work that I have done in the past as a in a teaching capacity. So, you know, I don't think it's um, it's not an indictment on a character. It's just a recognition that they're in a situation where they could have influence or access to children. So is that OK? Yes, thank you. OK, um, did, Mr Weller, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, only to emphasise that the, the whole driver behind the these standards from the Department from Transport and the whole thing behind the training uh, that, that you receive is that taxi drivers and private hire drivers may at some time in their professional life be responsible for transporting some of the most vulnerable members of our community uh, and therefore 
we should do all that we can to ensure that the travelling public are protected throughout. Thank yeah. you, Mr Weller. Yes, it's, it's a matter of public safety, Councillor Harvey. OK, we've had quite a lot of uh, comment from one of the. Um, well, we have two people who wish to speak, uh, Miss Jackson and Councillor Hales. Thank you, um, Councillor Wilson. So, um, Miss Jackson. Um, I'd just like to highlight um, the, the bit about the small cost um, incurred by drivers and one of the comments from the responses. Um, so what, what actually happens is a DBS certificate is done and that costs £54.95. Um, from that, you have to subscribe to the update service within a certain period of time, which is set by the DBS service. I think at the moment it's 28 days. Um, from then you pay a subscription of £13 per year. So actually, if you were to have a license for three years, it works out cheaper to join for the driver to join the, the DB update service. So the small charge would not change um, if, it, if it was checked six monthly, there would, wouldn't be any additional cost. And, and going back to um, Councillor Harvey talking about the, the DBS, um, so we quite regularly have notes which are put on to the DBS um, maybe it would be by the local police or the national police. And um, what happens with the check-in is it goes to five different departments um, and, it, and it goes through. If um, the police, it's, it's down to an individual um, within the police to decide whether they feel that that's relevant, the notes or the conviction to what the, um, the application is for. So um, when we do the DBS um, searches, um, for the certificate, um, we put down private hire driver so that that's the workforce that, that they'll be doing. So, for example, we have had notes that have come back to say there have been alleged charges for certain things um, which there was never a conviction for. So, um, for us passing information to the DBS, it would then be down to the individual police officer who was dealing with that check to decide whether it was relevant to. Um, somebody who having a, a private hire or a hackney carriage license. Does that make it sound mm. clearer? Thank you, Miss Jackson. That's helpful. And Councillor Hales. Thank you. I've got three points if I may. They're all to do with the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, Miss Jackson said, like the uh, update service costs you £13 a year and it's the 28 day cut off from actually when the DBS is first issued or applied for. Um, what do we do if uh, it's really reasonable actually, once you've done your DBS, if you apply for the update straight away um, as part of the process of applying for a license? And I'm just, my question really is through you to Miss Jackson, is what do we do at the moment with regards to that? Is it, is, do we take punitive measures for people not doing it? Or is it the fact that we just check them every, every, every year at the moment and then cost them 59 quid or 54 quid? And lastly, is that since that it's been mentioned and Miss Jackson's mentioned it as well that we have no control over direct debits and what have you that is this something that we're actively lobbying um, the ministry on because frankly this is the 21st century and if someone sets up a direct debit for a service to check and make sure that they are worthy of having holding a license surely it's something that the system should make easy to take that 13 pound a year off of them I think that's it thank you Thank you, Councillor Hales. Ms Jackson, can you answer those? Um, so yes, the direct debit part is something that the Institute of Licensing have raised a number of times and the DBS um, have, have um, confirmed that, that they're working on setting up a, a direct debit payment system. Um, so th that's probably been lobbied, as you say, for um, the last 18 months. We haven't heard anything different for, for that. Um, as regard to the checks, when we go on uh, to do the check, um, it will we will get a message saying um, uh, nothing has changed since the certificate was issued, or no change since the certificate. Sorry, it was issued, or we will have a message saying please check certificate or um, redo um, the update. So, so it doesn't tell us what the 
not redo the update service to do another certificate. So it doesn't actually tell us what the conviction is at that stage. The driver license holder would have to do another DBS certificate because there's there's new information on 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 their on their record. Okay, so and the other one was, do we have any, as it were, sanctions against against people who don't subscribe, other than the cost of actually picking them up when when something comes up? Okay, so when they have their initial um, new license appointment or renewal, and when the the license is issued, um, the, the, the driver actually has to sign um, a certificate to say that they they understand. Um, a statement, sorry, that they understand that the update service and the fact that they have to apply within 28 days from the date of the certificate. Um, so we keep that information out there. It's on the newsletter, it's on the website, it's in the handbook, and so that they're told verbally that, that they sign something to say that they understand, but we still have people that drop off. Um, and it will be then that we would chase them and they'd have to do a new DBS certificate. The problem being is at the moment, it's quite difficult to get people um, who aren't working to, to do that um, because they, they still want to keep their license, but they're, they're not working and why, you know, having to pay out the 54 pounds and then the subscription um, is a bit difficult. So we're, we are more lenient at the moment. Um, and it can be that if they refuse to, um, to, to do the certificate that they can be suspended or revoked. It does say in our policy that we can take that action if need be. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. So we do have a we do have an opportunity to suspend or revoke licenses if they if they don't subscribe to the um, renewal service. Does that answer your question, Councillor Hales? It, it does in the most part. Chair. The only bit about it is the update service. Um, I, I don't know if I heard Ms. Jackson wrong. Um, that uh, an opera, a license holder uh, would have to do if uh, if a uh, if a search came back which had showed up that there was a need for a DBS check or further information. If you've got an update service, I would just automatically assume that that would give us that information because the update service was constantly rolling. Um, is that not the case? Unfortunately, Jackson, could um, you answer that, please? Sorry. Uh, unfortunately not. No, they have to redo the update service if there's another conviction. Do you mean they have to do the £59? Oh, sorry, before? they have to do another um, certificate. Yeah, yeah. So if they haven't subscribed and something comes up, then the, the sanction, if you like, is that they have to pay for another £54.94 to get the new DBS. Yes, but it, I think what Councillor Hales is saying is if um, if there if there is a conviction, um, it doesn't show through the DBS update service, um, and it would mean that the license holder would have to do another certificate for us to get that information. And that the answer is yes, we would. Mm. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, Councillor Hales? And not being the most brilliant individual in the world of maths. It does. It does seem to be rather unnecessary. Then, if if someone has a conviction, um, then we're going to be checking anyway once a year or every six months or whatever it is. Then, the update service it still requires them to pay for a a, a full DBS check. Kind of, what's the point of the update service? So it's it's a way of informing us that there is a conviction. Unfortunately, they don't they don't let us know what the conviction is unless we do another um, certificate. Um, okay. But what you'll find is that if, if drivers are in that position, um, they probably don't go any further with their renewal. Right. Okay. So it's effectively the update service keeps us alert that there, there is a problem which then prompts us to ask them to do a new DBS. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. OK. Yeah. And we also require people to subscribe, don't we? Yes. OK. So yeah. 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 it yeah. kind of it, it does seem a little bit like the, the joined up thinking isn't particularly joined up. Mm. If all the authorities are actually doing our work, so to speak, our authority is doing its work and following every single rule and regulation laid down from above. 
it doesn't feel like above is making it joined up so that if a if a DBS or a, a conviction is triggered that actually surely everybody in that process officially in that process should be notified of an issue that so what, way we could cut out the middleman okay so what we're saying is that it feels as if if somebody's subscribed to the update system then we should be informed when something happens yeah. is that what we're yeah. saying that's okay. exactly what I'm saying, yeah. Right, so um, Mr. Weller, you've uh, noted uh, in chat, well, I'll read out. Um, additionally, they're also required to self-notify. Would you like to make a point, Mr. Weller? It, it goes back to the matter we discussed a little while ago. Your policy does require them to notify the authority should they be arrested or convicted or whatever. So the information on the DBS, they should be bringing to our attention as well. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, so they should be telling us also, shouldn't they? Yes. Yes. The, nothing so, on. Nothing so on the, the virtue. Okay. So the so the virtue of the automatic update is that it alerts us when they haven't self-notified to us. It alerts us for that. The other way of looking at it, if there is a driver without any conviction, then the update will allow him to be, uh, allow officers to check the DBS on a regular basis. If they see no change, then he has no requirement to apply, apply for a new DBS. Yes, so, um, it's, so, it's so the only, the, so the remaining question is, why is it not that if you are subscribing to the update service, why doesn't that mean that when you have a conviction that the DBS service informs us that there is a conviction? I, I think, councillors, that's way beyond your control. It's a matter for the exactly. DBS service. Um, in all things, they are a relatively new body. Um, two, three years further down the line, we may well be in that happy state, but we aren't yet. So, so currently we're alerted to a concern by the automatic, by, by the um, subscription service, but the the individual themselves is supposed to inform us as well. Yes. Of, of any, yes. Okay. So does that cover the ground, Ms. Councillor Hales? It, it certainly does, Chair. And um, just to say, I'm, I'm fully supportive of all the measures that have been going in here. It was just a query as to why it wasn't coming back the other way. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, OK, so moving. So are we happy with that 6.2 proposal then? It looks as though most of the operators and, and uh, drivers are. OK, are we all nodding? Lovely, yep. good. OK, so the next uh, one over the page on page 54 in Appendix B is 6.14. It's about a lack of language proficiency. Could I just ask? Miss Jackson, have we lost some wording? Because we've got the current situation, but we haven't got the proposal. Is that because we haven't decided what to do yet? Or has some proposal wording slipped off the page? The proposal wording seems to have gone to the right of the page there. Um, yeah, so can, just, so can you read us out what it should have said under proposal, please? Yeah. And slowly so we can write it down. I'm just trying to find the uh, correct document. One moment. Actually, I might even have it here. Uh, hang on, I've got it here. Uh, Here we are, I've got it. The proposal. Hmm. No, I've got the current situation, but I haven't got the proposal. Oh, here we are. All applicants must obtain a South Cambridgeshire District Council approved test or equivalent qualification of a driver's proficiency to cover both oral and written and language skills. Does anybody want me to read that again? 
No, it should be agreed. Yeah, so it's it's a requirement that they should obtain an approved test or equivalent qualification of a driver's proficiency to cover both oral and written English language skills. So that's the, that's that's the proposal. And indeed, um, the drivers, the operators, the licensed operator and the resident all agreed. So are we all happy with that? Um, Councillor yes, Hales, I'd like to speak. Councillor Hales, sorry. Uh, yes, Councillor Hales, do go ahead. And we've got Peter Fain afterwards. Much obliged, Chair. You said um, it's the DC test or another uh, another approved test. Is there any reason why we can't have it exclusively as an SCDC test since that we are a licensing authority? Um, it's because we want to make use of language tests which are available um, uh, 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 that we can pick up. So this is the policy. We want to set that an approved test that we agree is what they must do. But the detail of the actual nature of that test will be in the handbook which can be changed more readily and doesn't require committee consideration. So it's um, so this is the principle that they must do an approved test. Does that explain it? Um, kind of. Um, if I could explain my thoughts, if I may. Surely. Um, how to do it tactfully. Um, you can buy or obtain quite a lot of information as you see fit from wherever you like. And if the tests and requirements for licensing are fulfilled through the licensing authority, that can't happen. It can only that can only be an absolutely adjudicated process through the SCDC licensing team. So there is it takes out any any attempt, potential attempt by anybody for fraud. OK. Um my understanding is when we discussed this before, we said there are a, new, a number of highly reputable language um, language training providers in Cambridge, and we could we would do well to contract in one of their tests that or, or a, a number of tests, uh, you know, a, a selection of maybe two or three or perhaps just one. Uh, that we felt was suitable for what we do and get them accreditation through that means. Miss Jackson, did you want to clarify that? Um, yeah, so we, we did also talk um, about um, the government approved ones for um, residency and um, citizenship as well, the ones that they use. So there are a number of tests that we can look at. And that probably would be a, a procurement exercise to to find the, the standard that we require. Um, the problem being is something that was brought up earlier that we're not actually capable of, of, of running the test because we're not we're not trained to do that. We're not teachers. Mm. So um, is uh, I think I, I hear what you say, Councillor Hales, but I think we would be ill advised to try to run this kind of training ourselves. And I think if we have uh, access to a government approved tests that we recognise suit our purpose, I think that would be the best way to go. Do any other members? Uh, I, Councillor Fain also wanted to speak. Was it on this matter, Ms. Councillor Fain? Yes, um, perhaps I take a different view from Councillor Hales on this. Uh, I think Ms. Jackson just said it herself that we are not qualified to run language tests and there is a, a danger of this being um, rather subjective uh, not entirely consistent between different applicants uh, if we are ourselves trying to run a test rather than to ask people to secure a certificate of some form uh, from somebody who is qualified in language testing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Fain. Um, um, so we have two hands up, Councillor Harvey and Councillor Howell. I don't know whether they I think Councillor Harvey's maybe a legacy hand, but oh. Councillor Harvey, do you want to speak? OK, and which was the other one? Councillor Howell. Oh, Councillor Howell, thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Just a very quick one. Could I ask the officers, not nothing for the policy, but to be to main note that we do have some people who have great difficulty in reading through dyslexia and other reasons such as that. And can we have um, an understanding look at them uh, when they come forward? That's all I'm asking is that we, you, you know, I'm sure the language schools and different things can have an understanding look at the way we do things. Sometimes it's with regards to extra sheets with it. They would supply uh, acetates to go over and sometimes they need certain words um, explained because they can't read the words. So that's all I'm asking that we have a sympathy or an understanding towards people who have those difficulties, um, which, which they can't, there's no way it can be overcome. Thank you, Chairman. And Thank you, Councillor Howell. And um, would I understand you to mean that our understanding would be that some of those people, whilst they might have difficulty reading, they wouldn't have any difficulty in operating the normal um, dispatch systems and mapping systems that they use for their job? That's very true, Chairman, and actually, uh, um, conversely, very often people who do have a difficulty, especially with the written and spelling of words, are exceptionally good with regards to map reading and being able to plan routes and different things such as that, the way the brain works. So all I'm asking is for an understanding and to have that understanding for our officers, please. OK, so um, Ms Jackson, could we um, make sure that we make a note that the that when we this is for policy and I think in principle people seem to be agreed but I just want to check that we when we go through to the handbook and when we go to procurement that we make sure that the language train uh, the language certification that we procure does recognize the fact that that um, the the most of the work that these people would do is not necessarily written <laughs> Can we, Ms. Jackson, have you a view on that? Um, so we do have, um, we do, we have had a number of people that have come through the, the system and have had to do the competency test who are dyslexic. We've provided extra help for that, so we are aware that there are problems there. Um, so it does actually say for the English, um, so to cover both oral and written English skills to achieve the obje objectives. So that, that is what we'd be concentrating on as part of the procurement for the, the test. Going back to um, somebody mentioning uh, about the, the types of tests, of course, you might you will find that there will have been people who will have GCSE or O-level English, and it may be that that would be an accepted test anyway, which would save an awful lot of people of having to do a, another ling language proficiency. That is something to think about. OK, thank you. Uh, right, and I can see that Councillor Dr. Bhattacharya's hand is up. Councillor Bhattacharya, can I ask that, in f that you request to speak through chat? Thank you. But what is your question? And would so, you uh, so excuse me. Oh. Um, um, Councillor Hales had had asked to speak okay. first. Okay. So Councillor Hales, do you want to come back? Thank you, Chair. Uh, two things. Uh, fully endorse Councillor Hales. Uh, Councillor Hales, sorry. Uh, we're not brothers. Um, uh, comments with regards to dyslexia, in my view, haven't thought of that at all. And given the explanations given by Ms. Jackson and whatever, I had completely forgotten about the government regulated um, uh, language test. So essentially, I was wrong and I will withdraw my comments with regards to uh, any suggestion of fraud. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Hales. Thank Councillor you. Bhattacharya, would you like to put your hand down and say what you wish? Okay, thank you, Chair. So in spite of having good English knowledge or in spite of having very good English written or the past written test, people who are dealing with customer outside they mainly they face the accent. They also face the accent. I mean the spoken English accent. So is there any possible way of helping them putting a bit of notice or notifying something uh, that I'm not a native English speaker? So I may take some longer time to understand. Uh, I, is I, I think I think I, I hear what you say, but I think the it is important we recognise the whole purpose of this uh, recommendation from the Department for Transport is that we make pa travel safer for our passengers using private hire and hackney carriages and the, the onus is on the driver 
to ensure that they they can reach an adequate uh, standard as assessed by, as we've just described, a government approved test that's appropriate for the work that they're doing. And that's why I'm saying that through the procurement pro process, we need to be sure that the, the type of um, qualification is appropriate for the work that's being done. And I think actually, if I may say so, that it would be worse for them to actually have to declare that they couldn't speak English. I want them to be able to speak English. No, no, not no. To have to, to say, give me more no, time. No, sorry. I, I did not mean that. I did not say that. What I said that just giving, they, there are many people, they are very good in English. They can write and read English very well than many, uh, many average people, but the accent and understanding of the local local accent, understanding the local accent, because I am coming from a different place of the world, different part of the world, so I understand because I lived in Edinburgh, Belfast, and now in now in Cambridge. So the so the so the understanding the local English accent may have they may have difficulties to understand the accent, not the English language. I understand. So, I understand what you're saying. And I think the onus is on them to say, excuse me, please, could you repeat that? Or excuse me, could you slow down? I think that's really down to the driver or the operator. Right. OK, thank you. Right. So are we happy with that? We seem to be happy with uh, I'm getting noises off from perhaps Councillor Howells's microphone. I'm not sure, but I think in principle everybody seems to be broadly happy with that. Is that my understanding correct? Good, lovely. OK, so. That takes us on to in my book. Um, uh, just to just to be clear. You'll remember that at 7.2 in the standards, there's reference to CCTV, which of course we've already incorporated into our policy. Uh, so that's why there are no questions about that. Uh, we incorporated that into the policy and uh, this is the requirement for them to have CCTV. That was in the policy in April 2018, although we at that time we agreed exempt drivers wouldn't have to uh, have it. But then in 2020, we um, included it for all drivers of all types of uh, private hire vehicle. Right, moving on then, um, we come to 8.8, .8, which is a section looking at, sorry, so we're at the bottom of page 54, and 8.8 .8 is on page 40 of the um, the proposed new standards. And th this is looking at dispatch staff. This is the people who take the booking and decide which drivers they'll send on the job. And the request is that these people should be, there should be a register of staff that will take bookings or dispatch vehicles. And the proposal is that those people will be required to keep a register of all staff taking bookings because we recognise that that's, that role recognises that the person making the booking could be vulnerable. Um, so can I just take that part first? Are we happy with that? Councillor Roberts would like to speak. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Um, I think this is a really important um, addition, Chairman, because not only could they be vulnerable, but but they could also have a, a bad record themselves um, that would um, could you know be inflicted. Um, they could be giving information on to um, other people. Um, they could be finding out the details of vulnerable people themselves. So I think this is a really good one and a really important one. Yes, and so you're perhaps alluding to 8.9 where it's saying that operators should be required to evidence that they have sight of a basic DBS check on all individuals listed on their register of booking and dispatch staff and to ensure that basic DBS checks are conducted on any individuals added to the register. And so it goes on. The point being that you can only be on the, the subscription register for enhanced DBS checks 
whereas these basic DBS checks peculiarly have to be done um, individually. So, um, Ms Jackson, do you want to just go through that for us? Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, go back to uh, what Councillor Roberts said about people having um, the, the, the dispatch staff, um, maybe be criminals themselves. What you've also got to remember is they're booking um, taxis maybe for airport journeys, so they would know that you know, Mr Jones or, or Mr Brown is taking his wife and, and two children on holiday. Um, and the house is empty. The house is empty. Yeah. It's going to be empty for two weeks. So they're, they, they're privy to an, an awful lot of information that can be passed on to or, or used by themselves. Um, so having that information about their, their criminal record is, um, is, is quite important. Um, Unfortunately, we can't do enhanced DBS checks on anyone other than um, people who are applying to be drivers. So we can't do non-driver non proprietors, people that own vehicles or um, uh, operators, unless, of course, they're, they're drivers themselves. And uh, the booking staff, again, it would be a DBS check that the operators themselves would have to carry out on them. And it would have to be a yearly check because you couldn't do the update service on a basic DBS. OK, so one that's helpful. Thank you, Ms Jackson. But one other thing I wanted to ask you about was one of the resident, the resident on page 55 has said uh, in, in principle, the, the driver has said that's fine. The license operator has said, yes, that's fine. But the resident has said it should read dispatch staff that work abroad. Now, are we suggesting that we're including the and a situation exists where you might have a call centre abroad that's doing dispatch. Um, so we do have a, a, a company that is op um, licensed by us that does have a, um, an office abroad that takes bookings. So yes, um, that's the answer. So if that, that work, if that dispatch staff is working abroad, do we still require the company that's licensed with us, the operator, to do a DBS check on those staff or, or some kind of record of good character? So you can't do a DBS check for somebody who lives abroad, um, but um, you can do um, a, a good, you can request a certificate of good character um, and that's done through the government. So each different, sorry, they would go to the government website and look at each country's different way of doing that. So. Um, it wouldn't be the equivalent of a DBS. It would be a certificate of good character as what, what they put in, in that the, the resident had put in that the equivalent of a DBS. We couldn't do that. So um, it may be that, um, for example, if you were looking at somebody who's coming from Sri Lanka, let's say, that their certificate of good character would have to be done by the embassy and, and translated by solicitor, or it would be um, with m most of them would be the local police station from where they're that the country that um, the, the town that they're living in. OK, and also the aspect that some com some operators <coughs> do dispatch um, by automatic algorithm, so not relying on human agents. Can you talk us through that? So again, you wouldn't be able to do any sort of checks on that. That would be completely out of our control. Mm. Yes, I'm not very happy with that myself. So, um, OK, my feeling is that I agree with the proposal. Does anybody not agree with that? Sorry, I'm not asking you to, if you have any genuine objections, then let me know. OK, everybody seems to agree. Good. So we're happy with the proposals at 8.8 .8 and 8.9. And I think if uh, app based operators find it difficult to comply, then they'll have to find a way of complying, I, I think. Mr Weller, have you any thoughts on that? I mean, presumably the Department for Transport wouldn't have set up something that uh, was um, inappropriately exclusive. No, and, and, and they can't. I think the problem is that we are moving into a different era. Uh, we, technology is being used. Some of these uh, organisations may well have booking staff that are abroad. We can't impose 
DBS on them because it it just physically wouldn't work. So it's whatever that country or nation has as the nearest equivalent, and we we would use that. It gives us some information. Yeah. OK, so broadly speaking, members, are we happy with that proposal then? At 8.8, 8, 8.9. Good. Lovely. Thank you. OK, so then over the page, um, we come to section, um, the section about use of passenger carrying vehicles. This is at 8.16 on page 41 in the standards and page uh, 56 in appendix b so this is this refers effectively to drivers um sorry this is passenger carrying vehicles and licensed drivers um so this is as it were minibus drivers and what we're what it's recognizing is that because the work i.e driving a bus does not present usually present the same risk to passengers, members of the public are entitled to expect that when making a booking uh, that they will receive a private hire licensed vehicle and driver and the use of a driver who holds a PCV license and the use of a public service vehicle such as a minibus to undertake a private hire vehicle booking should not be permitted as a condition of the private hire vehicle operator's license without the informed consent of the booker. So basically it simply requires that at the time of the booking they're told that um, they must gain the person who's booking the job, they must gain their consent in the knowledge that the PCV driver has different conditions and the vehicle has different conditions. So they must be advised in writing that the driver is subject to different checks and not required to have an enhanced DBS check. And that must be given in writing. Now, members, does anybody want to make a comment about that? I personally think that's a very good idea. I think certainly I suggested it when we we're discussing it. Councillor Wilson. I just wanted to ask, does in writing include by email? I think it does. I think that would have to go by text to somebody who was using Uber if that was how it happened. I yeah. find it hard to believe that's how it would work. Um, and indeed, actually, one business or organisation has said. A couple of people, the, the licensed driver and the resident have said they agree, but the business or organisation says that um, passenger carrying vehicle drivers to have different checks and measures and testing arrangements. We do not believe they should be used for private hire vehicles or taxi bookings. Um, and indeed, if you were just um, a person ringing up and wanting to make a booking. If you'd wanted to go by coach, you could have called a coach company directly. Uh, whereas you're making a booking because you think it's a taxi or a private hire vehicle and you might be being told no you've got more than eight people therefore I need to book you a different type of vehicle but they must be informed about the different conditions that apply. Do people have anything to say about that? Sorry Miss Jackson did you want to speak? I, I think your comment was before. I, I think you've you've covered it actually yeah okay. so you know, we, we do have a company that does um, and there's only one that I know of that does um, taxis and um, minibuses. But if you're if you're phoning to book a taxi, then that's what you expect. Yeah. So members, if our children were about to go off after a May ball or and 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 uh, booked a taxi and there were 10 of them, and they got a PCV driver rather than a taxi, would we feel differently about it? Perhaps I'll ask Councillor Harvey because he's looking very thoughtful. I can't, you're still muted. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sorry, no, I was just thinking, I, I suppose the reason that there is a difference in requirements is because there's a sort of safety in numbers, but um, 
I, I suppose there would be an issue if 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 you um, if you were just a, a, a single kind of fare um, and 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 a minibus turned up to take you, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? Um, but that's why you'd have to be told in writing that yes. it would be a different type of vehicle. Yeah, I think. So broadly, I agree. Yeah, I think broadly in principle, I'm I'm happy with this, and and I I agree with it. So, agreed, it, Chairman. Okay, thank you. So, um, and the principle, there are other things that we um, just just to complete the looking at the standards document. There were a couple of other items under section nine that I picked up, which is enforcing the, the licensing regime. And it said at 9.2 license on page 43, licensing authority should, where the need arises, jointly authorize officers from other authorities so that compliance and enforcement action can be taken against licensees from outside their area. Well, um, I understand we've never been asked to do that by another authority. And we have never sought to do that, uh, but um, and that sort of we've we've really never needed to do that. So um, I, I don't think we'd be against it, but we've never needed to do that. And the final one was 9.3. Some licensing authorities operate a points based system, which we do. So I think that covers the ground. So. I think we're coming towards the recommendation members, if, unless anybody wants to discuss anything else. The recommendation is on. Is on page eight of the agenda. At um, paragraph four of the officer's report and I'll just read it for us. So just before I do that, does anybody else want to raise anything else? No, OK. So the recommendation is it's recommended that the licensing committee recommends that the lead cabinet member for environmental services and licensing approves the new standards as written as license conditions, policy requirements and procedures. The Department for Transport expects these recommendations to be implemented unless there's a compelling reason, local reason not to. So can I um, take an indication? Do, 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 do my feeling is much of what we've read, we've agreed with. Does anybody wish to object to it as a whole policy, uh, a whole document, or does anybody wish to um, object to any section? All right, so I'll move that recommendation. Thank you. And uh, Councillor no. Roberts has said she's happy to uh, second. Is yeah. that okay? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. And uh, uh, so can I just take that by affirmation? If anybody wishes to object, please could they make that known now? Thank you very much. I can see that the comments that I have are from Councillor Hales and Councillor Howell that they approve and nobody has said that they wish to object. So thank you very much, members. Um, so we have uh, approved that recommendation. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chairman. And that's the end of the meeting. Can I thank you all for your attendance and uh, for uh, your contributions? Thank and you, Chairman. I will you, take away, uh, Councillor Bhattacharya, your wish to, to discuss some matters separately. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. Could I ask us to be take off? Could Liam, could you take us off the live stream, please? Yeah.